Hello everyone, welcome to Computer Science E76. This is lecture two, Java Primer. So the next five weeks are going to be all about Android and today is related to Android in that we're going to be going over from a relatively basic level up to at least the minimum required amount of information that you need to know about the Java language in order for us to start talking about coding for Android. So the prerequisites for the course weren't so specific as to say that you have to know Java inside and out and I certainly, after talking with some of you, uh, there seems to be a wide range of experience with Java. So for those of you that are experienced Java developers, you might find that today is a, is a bit of a refresher in some of the, uh, the Java basics. But uh, for those of you that are a little bit less comfortable, so long as you do find yourself comfortable in, with programming in other languages and even in object-oriented principles, hopefully you will find today as a good way of getting up to speed with all of the necessary material for Java specifically. So just a couple of things that I want to um, mention first. Uh, and it's, it's this. It's that um, Java, there's a, a great amount of documentation available for you if you are new to the Java language for you to get up to speed. And one of the ones that I recommend the most is in fact the tutorial that was given out. Uh, this URL is for, um, it's for the Sun version, which now forwards to Oracle. Um, but it's the same, basic, uh, the same basic tutorial that was available when, um, this, when I put this URL here. But still, this is a really good way if you uh, still find yourself a little bit uh, behind or a little bit confused perhaps on what, what Java language is all about, then that's a good way to get up and running to get started with that. So do take a look at that. Even if you find yourself with uh, pretty good knowledge about Java, but you just want to be able to know how to do one or two things, the tutorial is a good way to get up to speed with that. And the API, um, this is really, um, I, I'm putting up the, the, the um, URL for the API here, not so much for your use for Android devices, but just to show you that this does exist and it might actually be something that's interesting to you if you decide to code for Java outside of the scope of Android. And yeah, it is the case that there are a number of Java APIs that are available to us in the Android device, but not all of them that are actually available in, that, uh, in, the, in the Sun or Oracle API page are actually going to be listed there as well. So let's not waste any time and get right into it. So um, when, when you want to create a Java application and realize that what we're going to see today is relatively distinct from what we're going to see in the subsequent lectures just in the way that we are actually writing these applications. These applications are, are pure Java, uh, and you're, a lot of the things that you see today are rather some of the things that are not related to the syntax and the way that the Java language works uh, is going to be different in subsequent lectures when we actually start using Eclipse, the IDE, the, inter, the, uh, um, the IDE for Android and, and other things. Um, and um, it's something, to, it's something that's worth noting here that even though we have a bunch of Java files just in a directory and we're going to be using a terminal window, it's not going to be quite the same in subsequent lectures. But really what this is all about is getting us up to speed with the language itself. So notice that we have here just a bunch of Java um, files. They are in fact all just a bunch of um, plain text files that we can see here. If you happen to have a Mac, you already have the Java compiler built in, so there's not a lot that you have to do to get up and running. If you have a Windows machine, you might as well download Eclipse because that's one way that you can get the, um, uh, the Java runtime available to you and the, the compiler as well. But basically this is a very basic Java application. This is in fact the most basic type of application, a Hello World app. And when the project spec for the Android setup is released, that's the same sort of thing that you're going to be doing in the context of Android as well as creating your first Hello World Android app. And it's not that application that's going to be the most difficult thing. What is perhaps going to be the most difficult aspect of that project is in fact getting Eclipse set up. Because first you have to download Eclipse, then you have to download the Android SDK, then you have to download the Android uh, Eclipse plugin, and you have to get all of this stuff working together. Together, it sounds there's a number of, of moving parts that are necessary to get that up and running, but we'll step you through that in this project specification when it's released a little bit later today. So anyway, back to this Java stuff. So here you can see a couple of things, and I just want to point out some things about uh, the Java language that we're going to that are going to be useful for us um, in the upcoming weeks. And first of all, notice that we have one of the first lines that is not in fact a comment. Uh, one of the first lines is in fact something that says class code one. And so we're just creating an object called code one. We'll talk more about what this actually means for now, but for the context of this Hello World app, it really doesn't matter that we're creating a class, except to point out this one convention. Notice additionally that we have here a class name with a capitalized first letter, code one. There's no spaces or anything here. We can have numerals except as the first letter. But also this name happens to match the name of the file itself. So notice that this file that we're working with is in fact code one with capital C dot Java. 
And this is going to be useful for us because when we actually compile this, which you can do just with Java C space code one dot Java, not code 12, code one dot Java, after a few moments, it will actually return, indicating that this has, in fact, been created. If we take a look again at the list of files that we have here, not only do we have the Java file, but we also have a class file that was generated by this. And so what, it, what this Java C program is doing is not actually creating a binary file in the sense of another application that you might use, like a native application that you might actually run in, on your Mac or on your Windows machine, but it is in fact creating bytecode. And this bytecode is just some generic code that's being interpreted by another program. So in order for us to run this program, we have to run another program. We can't just run code1.class because code1.class, even though it's compiled, is not in fact a runnable or an executable application. We have to in fact tell what's called the Java Virtual Machine, or in this case, uh, when we're working with it fr just from the, um, uh, from the terminal, just this Java uh, application right here, that we want to run this class called Code1. And that is how we can run our program. So running a Java application then is basically a two-step process. First, you have to compile it into this middleman, this bytecode that's not native, uh, that's not native executable application code to your, your, your uh, platform, your computer's platform, but is in fact something that is interpreted then by, or is run rather by the Java virtual machine or this Java application. So this, it's this Java application that takes this bytecode and then translates it into the native executable binary code that your computer can then understand and is then able to execute this program code. Now, yes, I mentioned before that there's going to be some, some context that's going to change a little bit with regard to this Android application But the, uh, when we start working with Android applications. But this same thing happens to be the case in Android as well. It just so happens that when Android runs an application, it's not using the Java virtual machine. It's using another virtual machine called Dalvik. And this, all of this is under the hood in, uh, and it's separated from us as programmers. But it's worth noting that we are doing a similar thing in Android as well. When we actually compile an Android application, we are going to be making some bytecode. Then there's going to be some further optimization that happens behind the scenes. We're not going to see that because of Eclipse, but we'll talk talk about it a little bit in the next lecture. And then when this application is actually brought onto an Android device and run, it's run within this context of a virtual machine or this Dalvik virtual machine. So there is some parallel here, even though some of the details, some of the specific details are a little bit different from our case here when we're running this application code on our machine versus an Android device. All right, but notice that we have some, uh, some additional, or notice this convention. If we can come back to this idea of having that convention where we've named this Java file the same as that class, and it's then created a class file with the same name as well, code1.class, and it just so happens that when we type, when we tell the Java virtual machine which class we want to do, notice that we don't have to provide that dot class extension, we just want to tell it the class that exists. And it's going to look in this directory in all of the class files to see where that class actually exists. And then it's going to run the code that's specified within that class. So this is why this convention is important. It just helps us streamline all of this process and we don't have to worry then about uh, thinking about through thinking thinking through these details about where these classes exist and how we can actually run our application. This is going to be something that's important in the Android realm as well. When you create a new Java file, which you will do for a variety of activities, as as we'll find out next week, um, you actually want to name that class the same as the file name itself. I see a question. You can have multiple classes per document. It will, it will compile separate classes. You will actually see as we get into some more complicated Java applications that we'll also have um, subclasses as well, and that it treats that in a special way as well. So we'll take, pay attention as we compile um, particularly the latter um, uh, or the, really the later Java files, and you'll find the answer to that question. All right, so let's move on. Let's go back to this code then that we actually had a look at before, and this is really just a very simple Hello World application. And there's a couple of things that I have to say that even though this is Java and we're going to be using the same syntax in Android, to create the Android application, none of the code is actually going to be the same. There's not going to be a class called Code 1. Well, there will be a class. Perhaps the most, that's the most similar thing between this and an Android Hello World application. We will have a class definition, but that's going to even be tweaked a little bit. But there's not going to be a void main. Notice that here, one of the methods that we have, 
Um, if you're familiar perhaps with C or C++, you might call them functions, but really in Java we call them methods because they're all associated with an object. But here we have a void main. And so it's this, when we're running this Java virtual machine, that the, the virtual machine will look for when it actually wants to run this class. So it's going to look for this main method. It's going to execute the, the, um, all of the code that we have within that main method. However, one of the very first things you're going to notice in Android is that there is no main method. It's in fact nested very deep into the code that we don't have to worry about. We're actually going to be dealing with something entirely different, and we'll talk more about that next week. But notice that we have two lines of code here. One of them says system.out.print, hello world, and then the very next line is system.out.print, ln, which basically just prints a new line so that when, our, when we return uh, in our terminal window, we can actually see what it was that we can actually come back to the next line. It's really just a nicety. It's not something that's necessarily required. Now, again, to point out some of the differences, um, whoops, this is not what we want. Uh, when we, when, uh, I do also want to mention that this system uh, method is not going to be, or the system object, this capital SYS system right here, is not going to be used so much in the Android device, but it's something that us as Java programmers working with just a, a plain text output, something that we, we might work with quite a bit. Okay, so this is then the most basic application that we can have. What if we want, actually want to make it a little bit more interesting by introducing variables? Well, Java is very strictly typed. We can introduce a variety of variables. There are, um, uh, and there's some things that you actually have to know with regard to variables, and that is some of the naming conventions. They begin with letters, dollar sign, or underscore. Subsequent characters can also include numbers. Um, they are, in fact, case sensitive, and there's no spaces contained within them. Hopefully, this is sort of an obvious thing, but uh, that also results in a lot of camel casing, like this first name, phone number, that sort of thing. Basically, what, um, what you might expect there. Now, variables, um, when, when we name them, of course, there are a few reserved words that you can't use, like a for, for example. You can't name a variable for because that exists in, uh, elsewhere as a for loop. But here are some of the ones. If you want to see a more complete list, there's a URL available on the slides that you can take a look at. So just keep in mind, some of them, this does trip some people up every so often, that they'll try to actually name one of their variables as a reserved word, and it'll give you all sorts of weird errors, weird cryptic errors. So just be mindful that, th that you're not actually doing this. Now, types. When you're dealing with variable types, there are, in fact, only a limited number of primitive types available in Java. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a hint right now, and that is to look at the capitalization of these types. All of them are completely lowercase. Byte, short, int, long, float, double, boolean, and char are all lowercase. But what you will see in Java is that there are some types that actually have, even though they might be an integer type, they are, in fact, capitalized. So it's very important to talk about this right now. When we are dealing with a capitalized type, it is, in fact, an object. It is, in fact, a class that we're dealing with and not a primitive type. So for the vast majority of things, notice, for example, that we don't have strings here. There is no string primitive type. That is, in fact, a class that's built upon these primitive types. And whenever we want to create, then, a string, there is no lowercase s string variable data type. There is, in fact, a capital S string data type that involves that object uh, or, or us working with that object in particular. And I'll show you an example of that as we uh, iterate through some of these code examples. So some of these hopefully are a little bit obvious what they are. An integer is assigned 32-bit. Um, integer short is 16-bit. Byte is 8-bit, so on and so forth. You can find out um, all of the specific details of all of these data types online if you want to go um, if you want to go that way as well. So notice that we have here these data types. We have created two local. We have created two variables. Uh, one of them is num, and one of them is another num. Following all of the conventions that we've mentioned before, and we've set some data um, within as values for these uh, for these variables. So we have another num which is set equal to five, a num which is set equal to two, and then we just want to print them out. Now, the reason that this is kind of useful is that we get to see the concatenation operator, which here is a plus sign. If you come from uh, the realm of PHP, you might be used to some other things as well, or, or uh, rather other um, languages. You might be used to some other concatenating operator, but keep in mind here that we do use the plus sign to concatenate these types. But notice that we have defined here two different types of variables. One of them is a local variable, this int another num right here, which is defined within the scope of this main method. Now, right now, for all intents and purposes, we've defined two variables that are 
pretty much equivalent in their context just because there's one method. But when we start building on uh, extra methods and have additional methods, the variable scope becomes a very interesting or rather a very important thing to talk about. Because, and this trips, up, this trips up people every year, we have people that define variables within the context of a method, but this variable int another num, because it's been defined within this main method, is only available to the code that was, that's written within this method. If we actually want to make that, that data within a variable available to other methods as well within a class, then we have to define a field, which we can do outside of the context of the main method up here. So keep that in mind. The context of, and the definition of the, the variable scope is definitely important as we talk about the different types of methods, or rather methods, and, uh, and, and the many different types that we can implement within a class, as that might be something that can trip you up at some later point in time. All right, so moving on, let's now work with some less than primitive data types, in particular a string. Now notice here that I am defining a variable called str that is of type string, but again, remember that I said to pay attention to the capitalization of those data types. You can see that this is a capital S string, which tells us that it's not, in fact, a primitive data type, but it is an object. It's actually an object. It's a class that's been written elsewhere, and we are using that class. We are creating a new object, a new instantiation of the string object, and we are, in fact, creating, uh, we are placing some data within it. So we can use strings. Uh, we can use strings within the context of um, these double quotes here, and we can manipulate them just as we might with some other things as well. Now, um, pay attention here. We have a couple of different things. And when we want to print one out, it's pretty easy. We just use a, uh, the concatenation operator and add in and concatenate in the string. Uh, and when we want to deal with substrings, we can do that as well. Now, they're really the, the main point of us dealing with this is that you can see that string is, in fact, an object because we can reference a method within that object and be able to perform some manipulation in the data uh, within that object through here. So we can actually, if we looked up the API for this information or for this, this class, one second here, and then I can, I can help you out. Yes. So if we take a look at the Java doc, we can actually see that the string class has available to us or makes available to us a variety of methods that could be useful in our manipulation of those strings. One of those methods just happens to be the substring method. Uh, substring, let's see, where is it? That's over, I'm just gonna scroll because that's going to make it a little bit easier for us. It is in fact here, substring, uh, and there's, you can see that there's two different methods available to us where we can actually pull out a portion of that string, of that major string, through uh, providing some indices within that context as well. All right, so back to this idea. So now hopefully it's becoming a little bit more obvious what's happening here that string, the, the string data type is not in fact a primitive one, but is in fact an object that we can actually pull some methods or use some methods in order to further manipulate that string. Now if we actually want to see this in action, we of course first have to compile the source when that, when that is done, we can then run it. We can actually see what, is, what exactly is printed out. We have the number, the integer that, was, that, uh, that we created, and the full string, and then also the substring as well. All right, but let's move on to code four. By the way, all of this code is available on the course website. You can download it and follow along if you want on your own uh, laptop or even if you happen to be at home. Now, there are some gotchas with regard to typecasting in Java, uh, and that is as follows. So here we have a couple of, of, of variables. One of them is an integer, and one of them is a double, and one of them is even an integer encapsulated as a string, and then another one is, in fact, a full-blown string. So notice we have my int, my double, my string, and text string with each of these uh, values uh, respectively. Now let's, before we take a look too much at this, let's actually see what happens when we want to compile this. You know what, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm just going to compile everything at once so that I don't have to do that a lot. All right, now I can run code four. So here we have a variety of mathematical operations being performed on these integers. And well, not just on the integer, but some of the other variables as well. So when we take the integer that was uh, 123 and divide it by a certain number, we get this result 
here, which is 24. And this is actually perhaps the biggest gotcha that we might encounter in, as you actually work with Java. And the same thing will happen to you in, in Android devices as well. If you actually take an integer and divide it by another integer, only integer division is going to occur. That means that if there happens to be a decimal associated with this, it's just going to truncate that. It's just going to throw it away. And the result that you're going to get is, in fact, an integer. Now, be very careful about this, because when we start talking about the staff's choice um, application that you're going to be writing, it's, we actually, there's a little bit of math involved. There's a little bit of computation that your application has to actually do. And so many problems last year arose very simply from this very thing. I know it seems a little trivial right now, and you're like, yeah, I know, I get it. But pay close attention whenever you're doing division, because every year we had a number of people that were doing integer math, integer division. They were not getting the desired result um, because of that, that calculation. Yes? Do you cast the results? Uh, if, you, if we cast the results, you will just get the double version of the integer. So my int divided by 5, which is 123 divided by 5, is going to give us a result of 24 just as because it's throwing off the rest. And if we cast that result as a double, we will then get 24.0. So what we have to do, in fact, is to first cast the, ver the data that we want to divide by. So we have a couple of different options here. We could actually take our data and use it as a double. So my double here is 123.0. And then we can divide that by 5. And no longer then are we doing integer math. And we will actually get the value that we expect out of this. If we take a look again, we can see here my double divided by 5 now gives us 24.6, which is what we would have expected out of this operation to begin with. Now, if we, uh, so we can, in fact, deal with uh, integers as well if we wanted to do that. We just have to explicitly typecast that integer before we do that operation as a double. So we could do, for example, my int uh, typecast that as a double, which we can do with this typecasting operator in parentheses. In parentheses, double the primitive data type, my int, then divide that by, a, by an integer. And that same thing will result in a double uh, division occurring. Or what we can do is to have this other value. Really, um, the only time that you're going to get integer division is when both of the um, both of those numbers are, in fact, integers. But when one of them is a double, it doesn't matter which one you will get double division. So we could either make the first number a double, or we can make the second number a double. As we see here, my int divided by 5.0 will trigger a double division. We will still get the same value that we actually expect. We can see that here in the output as well. All right, um, and let's see. So when we, um, uh, we have a couple of different things that we can do uh, with, the, with the string. So uh, I just want to show you some of these other um, operations that we can perform on that. So keep that integer division in mind. But if we actually want to pull an integer out of a string, because we have like up here, for example, we actually have this variable called mySTR, which is a string, but contains the integer 123. If we actually want to make that into an integer so that we can then use it, you have to tell um, you have to actually use something that might not be very obvious at first. You can't just take this object, which is a string, and typecast it as an integer because that's not going to work. If we uncomment this, which is exactly that, where we take this integer, or we, rather we take that string and we try to typecast it as an int, it's actually not going to work. As we will see, if I compile this, this is code. Which one, which one are we working with here? Um, Code 4. So if I take code 4 and compile it, we can see that we have a problem here. We, in fact, get an error from the compiler saying that we have these types that are, in fact, not compatible. We cannot actually take this object and convert it into this primitive data type, a string. That's, in fact, not going to work. So the way that we can get around this is to use a method that's available to us from an integer class. Notice that we have here a corresponding to this primitive data type, an integer class, capital I, integer, with a method called parseInt that accepts this string data type and will spit out the resultant, the resultant integer. It will actually return this primitive data type integer. So for all of these primitive data types that we have, do we also have a corresponding object as well that you can access some methods to be able to perform some interesting things like parse int or some other things as well. You can take a look at the API to find out exactly what methods are available to you through these corresponding classes. Now, if we wanted to actually try to use this same idea to try to convert an actual string, 
notice that we're working with a different variable here, text string, instead of um, my str, which is related to the, uh, or which actually is this string hello world. We try to do the same thing where we try to, comp we try to compile this and then we run it. Notice that we don't get, in fact, a compiler error, but now we get a different type of error or an exception. So Java typically will give you exceptions when there is a problem and it will cause this hideous looking thing to happen. And if you get a Java exception, the best thing to do is to just read it like it says. And it will actually tell you, even though it looks kind of scary, it will actually tell you what exactly is going on and it will give you a little stack trace to help you figure out where the problem is actually occurring. So notice that we get this exception right here in thread main. Uh, and it's, this is the exception right here, number format exception for input string hello world. So we're trying to format a number from this string hello world. So obviously this is not going to work and it tells us where precisely this problem is occurring. Uh, if we keep following along, it says at java.lang.numberformatexception.forinputstring. That's not very helpful to us. That's not code that we've written. This is more code that we've not written, so on and so forth. And at the very bottom, we can see the origination point of this error, which was in our main method in the code for class at line 42. So this is useful. If you actually read these exceptions, they're actually useful. Now obviously we don't want exceptions to occur. There's, way that we, there's ways that we can catch these exceptions and be able to do something smart with them. And we'll see that in just a little while. Now let's move on. We have quite a bit of stuff still to cover. So here, if we actually want to be able to read some stuff from the keyboard, this is again specific only to actual Java um, programs where you're running them from your computer. This is not going to be useful for us um, in the Android portion, but we need to establish this because it's going to allow us to show some other things that, that are in fact useful for us in the Android portion. But we, here we can see a couple of things. <coughs> Excuse me. First, when I want to create, uh, when I want to input some data, I just have to instantiate a scanner class, as we can see here, just like this. Just take, unless you can sort of read this, just take for granted that this is in fact working. But the interesting bit right here is when we ask for the next int from this keyboard uh, variable, which is of type scanner, and the scanner class will actually provide to us whatever integer was, was typed in by the user. And then from there, we can actually do something neat like just see if the user can guess the number that we have input here and tell the user whether or not their number, the number that they have guessed actually matches the number that we have input or that we have here in, um, embedded within our code. So if I run this, it wants a number, I can type in a number and it can say whether the numbers match or I can type another number that's not right and you can see that it's just using a very simple condition statement here using an if block to determine whether or not we've actually typed this in properly. But also if we move on and try to do something like, uh, like this, type in ABC, we can actually get an exception out of this. But there's another, there's a pretty significant problem here and that is when I start to run this program, it doesn't actually tell me what to do. There's no instructions that are provided to us. And so this is something that's a, a, a good opportunity for us to um, make a little bit better, which we do in fact in code six, just by outputting some text immediately before asking the user to enter an integer. So this would do what you expect, ask the user to input in, enter an integer, and then we move on from there. It will actually then, uh, once we enter an integer, hit enter, it will then perform this if statement here, like you can see, and give us one of two options as a result. So in Java, if you're not familiar, the, double, the way that we can test for equality is using the double equal sign. Um, but there's a bit of an exception to this, as we'll find out in just a little while. You have to be careful with double integers uh, in Java. Now let's move on to code seven. If we actually want to now handle those exceptions that we were, so, that we were able to get so easily, we can, in fact, do that. So here, if I just run code seven, we can see what happens. If I do this properly, we can see that yes, it's, the numbers still match. But now if I type in some string, we can find that instead of getting that really obnoxious except, exception, we can actually catch that exception and do something. We can tell the user that something else has happened and we need to, um, to be careful with that. So here it's pretty much largely the same code as before, except for this try catch block that you see here. And this, in fact, is sort of the root of this exception handling. And this is something that you're going to have to use in Android a good amount just because of the sheer number of exceptions that can occur through a variety of methods um, uh, there. So here, rather than 
executing this keyboard.next int line just by itself, we are using this, we're encapsulating it within this try block to tell the runtime, to tell the Java runtime that we want to give this a shot and see if it's going to work. If it works, then that's well and good. We'll just continue along. But if something happens and an exception was thrown by this method that might have been thrown by some further nested method as we saw before, then we want to try to catch that exception. We're going to catch an exception E and then we can do something with that data. So in this case, we are just going to uh, say that there's been some invalid input and we're going to quit. Now, this is very much a scenario of do as I say, not as I do. It's generally not uh, accepted practice to use this general case of an exception object right here, like I have here, just an exception E. Exceptions are in fact objects in and of themselves, as you can tell from the that capitalization of that first letter. But generally what you see people do is to um, list uh, rather specifically the exception that you actually want to deal with. And I think that we got a nor input mismatch exception, and so generally that's what you want to uh, try to catch there. Now what this means is that this catch block is only going to be specific to that one exception, to that input mismatch exception, not to other exceptions that might occur as a result. So just keep that in mind that uh, it's generally a good idea to be more specific because if there's other types of exceptions that can occur, then you want to try to catch each of those and deal with each one appropriately. Um, but it is possible if you wanted to do just this and catch all of the exceptions that might actually occur as a result of that, uh, of that failure. Yes? Is there a preferred way to catch different types of exceptions and have So in, in Java, you can actually have multiple catch statements. So you can have a catch block for the input mismatch exception. You can have a catch block for other types of exceptions and handle each one appropriately. You don't actually have to, uh, you don't have to nest them. You don't have to do anything silly like that. But you can, in fact, if you have a number of them that you want to handle, you can list them each um, specifically as subsequent blocks. Right, exactly. So, yeah. It's, like a, it's a design decision whether or not you want to do, like, you know, you know bubble up exception handling in your app, I think. Right. Yeah, there are, a variety of, there are a variety of ways that we could do this. I mean, for right now, this, um, this is acceptable for this application because we are just catching all of the exceptions. But if we actually wanted to specify the difference between an input mismatch exception versus something else, then we could list that input mismatch. We could list that other one. Then we could even have the general exception at the very bottom to catch the remainder and then say something totally useless like unknown error occurred or something like that, just like is really frustrating when it happens to us uh, when using other applications. Did I see another? OK, perfect. All right, so here then we can see how we can catch these exceptions. So all of these. Um, are definitely useful and important to us when we are dealing with uh, not only Java applications, but uh, especially when we deal with Android applications as well. So here, let's move on to code eight. Oops, that's not right. By the way, that's what a class file looks like, just so you know, that's the compiled byte code. But that's not what we actually want to look at. We want to look at the original, uh, the original source code here in code8.java. Now, if we want to do this a little bit smarter, instead of just having uh, an if statement, you can, can of course, use a, a, a switch as well. If you happen to be familiar with the with a switch statement from other, um, from other languages, it works pretty much the same here in Java. You can say that you want to switch and have different cases and deal with the default case as well. Now, switches will only work with primitive data types, so that's important to note as well. In this case, input is, in fact, an integer, so we can have the different cases just for the, the, the varying types of integers as well. But moving on. Now, if we want to do something a little bit more interesting and try to do this similar thing, not with an integer, but with a string, like guess the word that I'm thinking, or something like that, we can using Java. So we have here this very similar code, except now instead of using in integers everywhere, we're using strings. But I want to show you something that's going to happen. This is code 9, so I'm going to run code 9. 
and it's going to ask me for a string. I'm just going to type in anything. You can see that it says here that the strings do not match. That's good. That's, a, that's correct because the, the string that we're trying to guess is this hello, comma, space, world. Now, if I actually type that string in exactly, notice what happens here. Strings do not match. Now, this is not a trick. There's nothing in this code that might uh, make you think, oh, you know, he's asking us this question, but there's this, um, you know, he's actually like truncating the, one of the strings or something like that. We are actually performing the comparison between these two objects, between these two strings. This one up here, hello, comma, world, and then the one that we just typed in, which as you saw just a moment ago, was in fact identical. And it was identical because I copy pasted it from this code. I didn't act actually have to type it in myself. But the, really the, di the difference has to do with this comparison operator right here. This comparison operator only works for primitive data types. It does not work, in fact, for objects. And that's what's happening. Both of these, both of these variables are objects. They are string objects, like we talked about before. str, the variable str, we can see at the very top of this window is defined as a string. Variable input is also defined as a string. They are both objects. And what we are, what we are comparing here are the values of these variables. And the values of these variables just happen to be references to those objects. And so because these two are not the same object, when we're comparing them, we're getting a failure. We are not actually seeing that they are, in fact, the same thing. This is yet another thing that we see every single year, that people forget this. And they're trying to do a comparison, even if it's a relatively simple object. Like uh, we might, well, I don't know if you'd consider a string a relatively simple object, but it is relatively simple, I guess, when you think that it's just a, an array of chars. And it's just not going to work because we are comparing the values of these raw variables, which in this case are the references to those objects somewhere else in memory. So because we're pointing somewhere else in memory, those two locations are in fact different. Even though the data contained within that object is the same, they are in fact two separate objects that are residing somewhere else in memory, or rather in distinct locations in memory. And therefore, this comparison is going to fail. So this is pretty, probably almost always not what you mean when you're comparing two objects. When you actually want to compare the data between two objects, you have to use something else. And it just so happens that the string, uh, the string uh, object, the string class, will actually allow us to uh, perform this comparison using a method that they have implemented called equals. So what we need to do is reference the equals method from one of these objects and pass into it another string object. And then the data contained within these objects will actually be compared. So this is actually what we mean instead. We actually want to compare the values that are contained within this str object and this input object to make sure that that array of chars is in fact the same array of chars in both objects. And that's what this equals method is going to do for us. So now if I run this instead, we can actually see the results. So I can type in something wrong, like you can see here, and that says, says strings do not match. But if I rerun, and I actually paste, hopefully I still have it pasted here, yep. And then I hit enter, we can actually see that we get the result that we want, where it performs the comparison in the string within the data that that object contains and not the, not the references therein, and we can then perform that, um, that query, that test successfully, like we can see here. All right, any questions about this before we move on? All right, moving on then, whoops, there I go again, to code 11. So um, Java does, in fact, have this, the notion of arrays. And it's very similar to arrays that you might see in other, um, in other languages as well. Um, but there is something of a bit of a difference from Java to other, um, to other languages. So here we can define an array. We define an array like this. We have a, a data type. In this case, we're just using a primitive data type, but you don't have to use primitive one. It can be an array of objects as well, like strings. Uh, you just replace that data type with the one you want to use. Then you have an open and closed square brackets, which tells the Java compiler that you're going to create an array of that data type. And then you provide the name that is going to be used as the array. So in this case, the very first line is that we are telling the Java compiler we want to create an array of uh, integers, and we're going to call that array grades. Then what we're going to do is actually create, we're actually going to, um, we're actually going to define or declare how big that array is going to be. 
Now this implies something very important about arrays in Java, and that is that they are static arrays. We are defining a length in this second line. We're saying that grades is going to be a new array of type int of size 15. So there's going to be 15 integer slots within this array, and that array is going to be stuck at that size for the duration of that program. As long as we are still using the same array, it's still going to only be 15 slots. Now, there are um, dynamic arrays that are available to us, but those are implemented not, um, not in the primitive language, but rather through objects. So you can, in fact, use these objects that will provide to you a dynamism in your array so that you can lengthen them or shorten them or do, or do whatever you need to do. But in the primitive Java, Java language, they are not, in fact, dynamic. They are, in fact, static. So you could use an array list object, for example, and then you'd be able to manipulate the length of the array. But really, this is then this is the important differentiation between Java and, uh, and some other languages where you can, in fact, just change dynamically the size of the array in runtime as, you, as the program actually progresses. Now, if you wanted to make a 2D array, you just have to add an additional set of square brackets afterwards. So rather than have just int and then open square bracket, close square bracket, you could create a two-dimensional array of integers by doing something like this. And then, if so if we give it... Uh, I don't know, let's just say we're going to call it graph, just like this. And then if you actually wanted to then uh, create or instantiate that, or not instantiate, but to actually d um, give that array a size, then we could do new int and then the size of the array like this. And you can do this for further dimensions as well, but that's the general idea here. All right, so here then we have this, this array. And so we can see in the first few lines of code, is it exactly the same as I mentioned just before? We are declaring an array, and then we're going to allocate the memory for it based on the number of indices that we actually want in that array. So in this case, we're going to create one called grades. And, and unlike the, uh, the slide, we're actually going to make only five slots for it. Then we're going to assign some values to that array. If you're familiar with arrays in other languages, this might look familiar to you. You can reference the, um, the indices. These are all zero indexed. So if you have five slots, that means you're going to have indices zero through four inclusive. So grades, open bracket, zero is the first position. One is the second position. Two is the third position, so on and so forth. We can set all of those positions equal to some, uh, some grades and then print them all out in a similar way. Now obviously this is kind of a stupid way of doing, of, of printing out all of these values when we could in fact use a loop and that's exactly what the next code is trying to show us. Uh, if we want to do, do a similar thing but this time instead print out those grades in a little bit smarter of a way we can now introduce to you the concept of for loops which is similar in Java as other languages so on and so forth and we can see here how we can do it. For int i is equal to zero so we have to define um, a new integer that allows us to iterate over each one. i is less than the, the length of the grades so notice that the length of the grades is in fact the same number that you input here but because whenever we reference these indices, they're zero index, it goes from zero to four, we have to make sure that we do not actually reach i, um, that i does not actually reach the value five or we will get uh, an exception. And so we just make sure that we are using less than the, uh, the length of grades. And then we just iterate over each one and spit out exactly that, the value that's contained within that array. Now, this is interesting because there's, an, there's an opportunity here for us to optimize this code. This code is actually not, if you were to implement the same code in, in a mobile device, this is actually not the best thing that you could do. You generally, you want to optimize your code when we're dealing with Android devices to be as optimal in terms of, of memory usage and speed as you can. And so in this case, what's happening here is that this grades.length is actually being recomputed, or it can be recomputed every iteration of this for loop. And this is not a good thing for us. And we actually want to avoid that altogether, which we do in code 13, where we do something a little bit different. We define two variables in this for loop, not just one, where we set i equal to zero, and we set j equal to the length of the grades. Because then, and this is more important perhaps for dynamic arrays, where the method actually has to look at the array and compute the entire length of that array, but it's still, but this is an interesting example of it. If, um, if we do this, we're pre-computing the length of that array, and of course we don't want to then change the length within this for loop, that could introduce other problems. But for the cost of a byte, we are then saving 
that, that loop, that operation from happening every single time that we are actually, th that this loop is actually being run. So then the test becomes very simply, i is less than j, we iterate over i, and then it's the same code within the for loop there. Um, and this is an important optimization because then no longer is that, is that perhaps um, that, um, uh, that, that length being recomputed, which could be a relatively slow process because it could be of uh, you know, big O n, basically of, of speed big O n, or in order for us to compute that length of that array as we iterate over each one, or that's something that's abstracted away from us. But it is important to note that this is an important optimization when we're dealing with dynamic arrays, especially in order for us to uh, make our code just a little bit faster um, in, in our application. All right, any questions about this? All right, moving on. Now, uh, just to show you some other types of, uh, of loops. So you saw for loop just a while ago. We also have while loops here where we could iterate while i is less than j and we predefined i and j above a couple lines before the while loop and then, I don't know, hopefully no surprises here. Uh, and, and if you can see in code 15, we're now using a do while loop, whereas basically the same thing as a while loop except the uh, it guarantees that it's going to be run at least once. And in fact, this is an interesting thing because if we come back to that same application that we were working with before, we can now do it just slightly differently. That application before that I'm referring to is in fact that one that accepts input and queries the user um, for to input an integer and, 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 uh, uh, and then compares that user's response to that built-in number. So if we use a do while loop, for example, and this is a, a good thing, a good implementation or a good use of um, the do while loop is something that you want to happen at least once, generally that thing could be, for example, user input. You generally want to ask the user for some input. You want to guarantee that it happens at least once. We can then use a do while loop to make sure of that. So here we can see what happens when we actually deal with uh, code 16. If we actually run it, Code 16, it's asked me to enter an integer. I'm just going to enter something. Uh, oops, all right. Uh, so, all right, I didn't do the, the failure first. So now we can see that rather than when an exception is actually caused, we can catch that exception. We can just ask the user to re-input re their data rather than continuously cause that application to fail in case that, um, uh, uh, you know, in case that the user is continually being dumb and not giving you the, the data that you actually want. So I can just keep doing a bunch of invalid things. When I actually enter an integer, then it can actually say, okay, now you've finally given us the answer that we want or the type of data that we want, and we can move on from there. So the way that we're able to do this is with this do while loop. We want to ask the user at least once, but perhaps not any further than that. So the very first thing we do is just we have a, this central value of, of invalid. We say that it's in, we're just going to assume that um, it's not invalid quite yet, so that means that the data is in fact valid. Then we're just going to ask the user for some input. And if it just so happens that we do receive an exception because that user perhaps has not given us the right type of data, then we can say that that data is in fact invalid, say invalid is true, and continue to loop through all of this code while that data is in fact invalid. So again, just a simple implementation of a do while loop allows us to be able to um, ask the user at least once for that data and no, long, uh, no more than that if, if it happens to be correct, like here, or to continue asking if they are not doing the right thing. All right, any questions on this? No, oh, there I go again, code17.java. All right, so now, when we actually want to deal with some of the more interesting aspects of Java, it has to come through the, some, of the other, some of the other aspects that, um, uh, that we have to, that we have, we've talked about before, but just alluded to, did a little bit of hand waving. That involves dealing with methods and with uh, um, the objects themselves, how we can actually define objects, and all of these other sorts of things. So here, we have defined another, uh, another file called code17, and this one actually has more than just a main method. It does, in fact, have other methods created as well. If we actually scroll down, we can see some of them listed here. Public code 17, public void set, public int get, and all of these are different methods that have been created within the context of this code 17 class 
in order for us to be able to perform some manipulations to some data. So notice that we still have here a main method within this class. And it is still required. It is the entry point for the, an application when we're using the Java Virtual Machine to know where to start running into this application that's, um, that we've created here. But um, we also want to create other methods so that we can create some other interesting aspects within this class uh, uh, directly. So here we have here a couple of interesting lines of code. We have here a variable called my object, which is being created of type code 17. So this is now we're, this, this numbering scheme or this naming scheme for these classes is starting to break down a little bit because there's no, this is a bit abstract. What does it mean for it, for this data, for this variable, my object to be of type code 17 and to have this keyword here, new code 17, but bear with me for a little bit. So we'll see what, we'll tear this down and see what this actually means. Then the next line of code says that we want to print some value. We actually want to print out something that's provided to us from this method here, dot get. So what is it, what exactly is happening here? Well, notice this very first line of code again. We are creating here a variable called my object that is of type code 17. So yeah, again, this is a little bit contrived it's just because of the naming scheme, but just work with me for a minute and hopefully this will become a little bit more obvious what's happening. And what we are doing is we are creating this object. We're saying that we have, we're going to create a variable that's of this type and we're going to instantiate a new copy of this object. So all of these classes that we've been creating are in fact classes that can be instantiated as objects within our code or referenced by other pieces of code elsewhere. But it just so happens that because we've been naming them sort of useless things, code 17, code 16, so on and so forth, there's no context for what that object actually is or what that ac object actually does. Um, we could name it something else altogether, like class string, for example, if we wanted to implement a string class. Or uh, we could call it any number of things, depending on the type of object that we're actually creating. But in this case, it's just this abstract concept of an object called code 17, which happens to have a couple of, of uh, pieces of data associated with it, in particular, this number field, which is, as you notice, it has this private keyword associated with it and is of type integer. And we also have some variable, or rather some methods that are available to us as well. So here notice that we have keywords in, uh, in front of each of these method declarations. So we have here uh, a set method that's re returning type data of void, which means that we're not going to return any data whatsoever from this set method. And it is in fact a public method, which means that other pieces of code can reference, other pieces of code that are outside of this object can reference this method when it actually is instantiated and we actually want to use that method. All of the methods that we've used in other classes, the substring method, the parse int method, all of those are public methods that our code can access outside of the context of that, um, of that, that raw code that actually writes, uh, that was actually written for those classes. And we also have a get function here that is a returning a type int and is also a public method. Now we have at the very top though, I, I didn't really talk about it here, we have in fact a constructor. So a constructor is going to be useful for us when, we, when that object is actually instantiated by using that new keyword as we saw above, new code 17, that constructor is actually, um, is actually run to be able to set some, uh, some data to some default values or just to get the class ready, to get that object ready for use outside of this uh, or outside of these methods. So what we need to do at the onset of, of the creation of this class or in the instantiation of this class is just to, just to set our field variable number equal to zero, just to make sure that it has some default value that we can then manipulate at a further point in time. Now the constructor, you can tell that it's a constructor because it's a public method that is um, named the same as the class itself. So the class was named code 17, so the method name for the constructor will also be code 17 with a capital C, as you can see here. All right, so what then, hopefully this demystifies what's happening here. We have in this first line, again, this new variable that's created that is of type code 17. We're instantiating a new copy of this object, this sort of abstract object called code 17 and it has that field, that private field variable num and all of these three methods associated with it. And we're actually then 
instantiating that and placing that into this variable called my object. And that means that we can then reference those public, um, those public um, uh, methods that we've written below within or from that my object, uh, from that my object variable. So my object dot is telling us that we want to run this get method from this, this object or from this, this variable that we've called my object, we can then retrieve that data and do something with it. So as you might recall, that, that getter method below, all it was meant to do was just to return this value, num, and uh, that's all that's going to happen. Is that it will return that, vari that value, num, whatever ha it happens to be, and it will then be printed out in this line of code, in this system.out.println. Then the very next function is going to be, or the very next line of code is going to be a very simple method where we provide some data to that setter, this myObject.set, and then that will actually change that value for num, and then we can actually then see what the change is when we, re, when we re pull out that data from this new get method or from that, the second um, use of this get method. So if we actually run this and see what it is going to look like, we can see it looks like this. This is perhaps exactly what we would expect. When we first instantiate this object, that num field was set to zero. So when we output that data, it's going to be zero. Then when we, when we set it to be something, in that case, we set it to be a value of two, we can re-output it to be this value of two here. All right, so let's take a quick five minute break. When we come back, we'll take a look at some more stuff regarding Java. All right, welcome back everybody. So before the break, we talked uh, with a little bit of a contrived example about how we can actually implement some methods within a class, but is there something that might, be, uh, might make a little bit more sense in the context of what it is that we want to talk about? And so objects are very sort of abstract idea, but we can try to make them a little bit more concrete if we try to model perhaps something that exists in the real world. And that is what we're trying to do with the next iteration of this code, code 18.java. So here what we're trying to do is we're still going to use methods and we're going to, we're going to write our own class and implement it, but we're actually going to make something that is, makes just the tiniest bit more sense in the context of a real world object. And so again, objects do not necessarily have to be something that, um, that um, replicate the functionality of something real world, but it might make a little bit of sense for us to talk about it and make this idea a little bit more concrete if we actually use this idea in a more real world, more concrete example. So we have here um, in code 18 just a, a whole bunch of stuff going on, but we're dealing with, in this case, cars. And so in this case, we're going to create a couple of cars, a slow car and a fast car, and we're going to perhaps replicate some data uh, or, or some of the features of a car, and, very, and by, by that I mean it's going to be an oversimplified um, example of what a car might actually be, and we're going to manipulate those objects using methods that we've implemented within that object. Uh, within, within that object. And so we have here a class called car, and so we haven't actually implemented this car class in this code 18 class. You can actually see that it is in fact elsewhere. It is in fact created elsewhere as well. We could have created it within the scope of this code 18 class, but it's perhaps something that is going to be a big enough object that I want to manipulate and use elsewhere. So I have in fact created another class altogether called car.java. And so this class then has been created just for the express purpose of using it within code 18, but I could use it with other, from other classes as well. But here we can see then what we have created um, for this, this specific object. And notice, one of the first things you will notice is that there is not, in fact, a void main for this class. And that is because this class is not meant to be run directly. There's not, this, this concept of a, of a car is not meant to be run as a program using this Java virtual machine. And so there is therefore no main method contained within it. It is purely referenced from that, um, from that code 18 class, and therefore the code 18 class has to have a main method for us to be able to run this particular application. But if I actually go back to, oops, uh, let's see. If I actually open up car.java, we can then see how we've decided in this case to implement 
this object. And so in this case, there's just a few things that we're going to replicate in, a, in an overly simplistic way. We're going to have a string for the make of car that it is. We're going to have a string for the model, an integer for the year, so how old this car happens to be, uh, and a couple of other things like its speed, which happens to be a, a variable that represents its current speed at the, at the current moment, and also its maximum speed. So there's a way that we can tell these cars that they have a maximum speed just because of the variety of, of features that it has, like the engine, how um, its drag coefficient, all of these other things we might calculate outside of the, the context of this and define very explicitly. So obviously this is an overly simplistic way of representing a car, but it is representative of how we could create an object um, that has a number of available methods. So notice some things that we've done here. So all of these field variables are in fact private. So we can't reference them directly within this code 18 class, which is a separate class altogether and can only reference public methods and public variables that exist within this car class. So that means that every time we want to change or fetch the data of one of these field variables, we have to have either a getter method or a setter method that would allow us to do one or both of those things. Now, unfortunately in, in Java, there's no way that we can, uh, at least in, in the versions of Java that, we, that we're going to use and perhaps, uh, well, at least in, in Java that we are using, there's no way that we can pre-compute or that we, that we can automatically create all of these getter and setter methods. Those of you that are familiar with Objective-C or as you will see in, in the iOS lectures, there's actually ways that iOS would be able to automatically generate these getter and setter methods. So as of right now, we have to write all of this stuff on our own, but for the most part, it's not going to be anything that's going to be very difficult for us to be able to do. As you can see, some of these methods are in fact pretty short and pretty easy for us to implement. So if we just go through this class and see what it actually does, we can find out what a car is supposed to do in the context of this class. So we have here the very first method uh, available within or just after the field variables is the constructor for this class, public car, and we accept three variables within that constructor, the make, the model, and the year, and then we set our internal field variables equal to those variables that have been passed to our constructor. So we're setting the make of that car to the, the, ver the data that has been passed to us, the model, and the year follow suit as well. Then we have a method that can actually set the maximum speed of the car, we can also then set the variable there as well, or we can set that variable max speed equal to that data that has been passed to us. So if we keep going, we can try to set the speed of the car, and if it just so happens that the speed of the car exceeds the maximum speed, then we can say, well, that's not going to work, we can return false, and say that we can't actually set the speed of that car greater than, to the, greater than the maximum speed that it's capable of. Otherwise, we can in fact set that speed equal to what was requested and return true, just to say that, yeah, that, that operation completed successfully. Now we can get some of the information from this class just by, um, by calling one of these other getter methods, get the speed, which is the current speed, the make, the model, and the year, which were all set in the constructor of this, um, of this class. Now going back to code 18 then, can we actually see how we then use all of this stuff. So we have then two variables. We have one called a tortoise, one called a hare. Both of them are of type car, but they're instantiating different copies, two separate copies of this car class. So we have one of them, which is a Toyota Camry, one of them, which is a Ferrari, and so one of them should hopefully be faster than the other. So the tortoise, we can set a maximum speed in some arbitrary units, which we haven't actually defined here. We can set the speed for the hare as well, and try to set this, the, the current speed then for each of these cars. And if it just so happens that those cars are able to set the speed because it, that, that method set speed has returned true, then we will print out some data and tell the user that that happened successfully. Otherwise, we will tell the user that no, that was not able to happen successfully. So we have a variety of methods that we're calling here. We have methods that are available from these, from these classes the hair, or more, the, more generally, this car class that we are then referencing from, from that specific object by using this dot notation, and also methods that we, have, that we have implemented within the same class. So print success and print failure are both methods that we have defined within this code 18 class that we can reference without needing to use this dot notation because they are in fact written elsewhere and we can just reference them directly.
So if we take a look at these print success and print failure methods, we can see that they look like this. Now the, this print success method is just going to print out the year, the make, the model of the car, and what the speed is of that car. And here we've arbitrarily assigned units of miles per hour to, all, to the, the speed of, of each of these cars. And if that, um, if that set speed method from the car class returns a false, that means that we're going to print a failure and tell the user that your, their car with that make, model, and year is unable to go that fast. And so then it becomes a relatively simple thing to try to set the speed of each of these two, um, of each of these two classes or each of these two objects and to either print success or print failure without having to replicate those lengthy bits of code in each of these if-else blocks. So if we actually run this code then, code 18, we can actually see what actually happens. So we've created both of these objects. We've instantiated both of these objects. We've set maximum speeds for both of them. We tried to set the speed of each of them to something really fast, like 155 miles an hour. The Ferrari, in this case, can go that fast. But this other object, the Camry, has decided that it can't go that fast and therefore has returned a failure in this case. All right, so then using this, we can actually then implement a whole bunch of different types of methods and use them not only within our same class, but use them also in the context of a different class as well. Now, there is something that's kind of interesting that you can see here. And here we can actually pass uh, data types. So this might, I don't know, if when, you, when, when I first started working with Java and I was still sort of new to object-oriented programming, this sort of blew my mind a little bit that you could actually use arbitrary data types, not just primitive ones. I guess there's more the fact that there's this notion of this concrete object of a car being passed from one function to the next. But really all it is is it's just this arbitrary data type that we've created. But here you can create methods that can actually accept objects arbitrary of arbitrary type, not just primitive data types that can actually accept objects directly and be able to manipulate those just as you would from other methods and the main method as well. So in this case, we are passing in just this generic object that we're calling my car that is of type car. And we are fetching the year, the make, and the model from that specific object and manipulating that data as well. And this actually alludes to a very interesting and very important point that we have to talk about with, with regard to passing data in, as parameters in Java. And the example here is actually made a little bit more clear when we deal with code19.java. And so here we're taking a little bit of a turn. We're not dealing with these cars anymore, but in fact we're going to work with this nebulous concept of a point, or in this case uh, two values that we're trying to, to swap. So in this case, we have defined a couple of different things. First, we have two integer fields, first num and second num. Both of them are private just because we're working within the, the context of this class. Another class that we have defined called a point, one of them has, uh, or we have within this class, so this is a nested class like we were talking about before. We have a nested class within the context of this code 19 class. And notice that we have defined this class class point right here to be private. That means that we can use this class within the context of our code 19, all in, in this entire code 19 class, but we couldn't actually reference this elsewhere. It wouldn't actually be available to us if we tried to use this, this class in some other uh, source codes elsewhere. And we have here basically the same thing that we've seen elsewhere, but just a much smaller version of what we've seen in like that car class, for example, where we have an X and a Y public fi uh, uh, field variables. But notice that these are public, which means that we can access them directly. We don't actually have to use setter or getter methods to manipulate or retrieve the data contained within each of these field variables. We also have then a constructor, uh, constructor method that allows us to set x and y, those field variables, to some initial values at the onset. Now we have a couple of methods implemented here. Both of them are called swap, and we'll talk about this in just a minute. And we have, of course, our main method. Now we have, of course, these two methods that have been defined, and they're named the same thing. But in Java, you can do this. You can actually do this. This is called overloading. So long as these two methods are different in some way, then we can actually create two methods with the same name, and Java will be able to pick the appropriate one dependent on the context of the data that you're passing into it. So notice that in this case, even though the definitions are the same, it's the parameters between these two methods that are different. So the top swap method accepts two parameters of type integer, an x and a y, does something with those. The second, um, the second method, swap, actually accepts a class, an object of, of type point, 
which was that nested class that we defined above, and we're just going to call that variable A, that object A in this case. And so in this case, with dependence on which one, which data we actually pass in, Java will pick the correct method and we'll call that and run that method um, uh, and, and, and proceed like that. So in addition to that first num, uh, uh, or rather that first num and that second num field variable that we had defined above, we are going to set some initial values for it, or one and two in this case, and then we're also going to instantiate a new point class or a new point object and put it into a variable that I'm calling A here. So if you're, if you're keeping track, we so far have three variables that we need to worry about. First num, second num, which are these public, uh, which are these, these field variables, not necessarily public, that are accessible within this entire class. Point A, or the variable A rather, which is of type point, and we're instantiating a new point class and passing into it uh, the values of three and four, which means that our, um, which means that our class, our field variables within that class have the values three and four as well. So we're actually going to write this down because it all gets pretty important in just a moment to try to figure out what exactly is happening in this code. Now those swap methods are going to do, or are supposed to do, what they imply. It's going to accept two variables or it's going to take two variables and it's going to try to swap the values within them. So I have here first num, and I have second num, and I have this, uh, uh, I have this variable a. First num and second num are integers, and I've set them equal to 1 and 2, respectively. Point a is an object, so I'm going to represent that by just drawing a little box here, and it has two variables within it, x and y, which are 3 and 4 respectively. Now this diagram isn't precisely accurate because A is actually a reference to this object and so perhaps what I should do is draw this off to the side a little bit. There, there's this object in memory somewhere that has the values x and y, 3 and 4, and then the value here really just points to that. Now generally, if you're familiar with the concept of references and all that from C, this might uh, hopefully make a little bit of sense, but if you're not that familiar with this concept, just keep in mind that all this is, all, all this is, is just a, a reference in memory, to, or rather a reference to some point in memory that tells Java what that object, or where that, actu that, where that object actually is in memory. But in, in the case of Java, we actually can't see as developers what that raw value is. We don't have access to that raw value um, that raw reference value in this case. Okay, so now what we're going to do is call swap on each of these two sets of data. What we're going to do first is try to swap first num and second num. And so what we hope, what our swap function should do, crossing our fingers, is to actually swap these two numbers so that the end result is we have first num equal to two and second num equal to one. We can take a look at what that swap function should actually look like up here, like this. So we take two, we take input of these two variables. We're just calling them arbitrarily x and y. Don't get them confused with the x and y variables from point because of variable scope. This x and y is local only to this method and not to any other methods. And what we're going to do is create a temporary variable and we're going to try to swap them. So if we took a naive interpretation of what's happening here, we could assume that this is what is happening. So we call this method swap, we pass in first num and second num, and then we actually perform the swap. We set temp equal to x, which is one. Then we set x equal to y, which means this becomes two, first num becomes two, and then second num becomes one, and then that's it, right? This should actually perform the swap. Now, we, because we are passing, and this is the important point in Java, when you have parameters, you are passing the values of those parameters, not the references. So if you're familiar with C, this, might, this, this makes sense. That, that description perhaps makes the most sense. If you're familiar with C or other related languages, you never ever are passing references in Java, only values. But this behavior becomes a little bit interesting when we realize what exactly is happening in the next swap function. But realize that because we're passing these values, what is actually happening to these variables first num and second num. So if I take a look down here, what we do first before we actually perform the swap is actually output them. So it will actually say first num is one, second num is two, then it's going to perform the swap. Then what is it going to say here? What is it going to output with this second line? First num is what? Two. 
1, and second num is 2. Right, so this swap wasn't actually performed on these first num and second num variables. What is the reason for that? Well, the reason is that this data was passed by value to, this, to that method. So I'm going to reset all of this stuff. Let's iterate through here and find out what is actually happening. So I have here these variables, first num and second num, but then I have this other method that I'm calling swap. And because those variables were created within the parameter list of that function above, uh, right here, these variables are basically created as local variables to this function. What this means is that I have x, I have y, and I have temp that are being created, but they are only exist within the confines of this method. So that means that when I pass in first num uh, uh, into this first parameter here and second num into the second parameter there, they get those copies of those values. So x becomes 1, y becomes 2, but there's no linkage beyond that passing of the value. So when we perform this swap, we're only performing the swap on these variables x and y. So temp now, as a result, if we just sort of iterate down through what's happening here, temp becomes x, so temp becomes 1. Then x equals y, so that means 1 here becomes 2. So y then becomes temp, which means that we have performed this swap successfully, but only on these variables that exist within this method. Once this method ends, and this method is now completed, all of this stuff is basically gone from memory. And nothing actually happened to first num and second num because we weren't manipulating those variables directly. We only had worked with the values, with copies of those values from, that, um, from, that, from those variables. Now, if I wanted to fix this, if I actually wanted to perform the swap on first num and second num, what do I have to do instead? So let's, let me ask this question slightly differently. If you were a C programmer, how would you, how would you perform this swap? What, what would you do differently? Yeah? You'd pass by reference. Right, you would pass by reference, which means that it, you would basically then, instead of, of passing by value, you would then have basically have x point to that same, uh, that same location in memory and have y point to that same location in memory, which means that as you manipulate x and y, you're actually manipulating the original locations in memory. You can't do that in Java. You always, always, always pass by value. You cannot pass by reference. So this concept doesn't exist, at least in the traditional sense, like we, like we might think of in C or some other programs that use, or some other languages that use similar concepts there. So perhaps what might be best, because these are field variables, would be to manipulate the field variables directly. Notice that we have here defined first num and second num outside of the scope of just that main method but they are because they're field variables defined at the very top, they're accessible to all of the methods inside of this code 19 class. Which means that I don't have to actually pass in x and y. I mean, I could, but what I could do here instead is actually deal with first num, like this, first num, and actually deal with second num, like this. Now this means that the parameters x and y become extraneous. We don't have to do it, but I'm just going to leave them here for now. But now would this work as we expect? Would this swap method actually swap those values in first num and second num, one and two? Yes. Yes. I see you. But it would have side effects if you try to use it in a different context. It would have side effects if you try to use it in a different, what, uh, what, what sort of side effects? Right, it is, right, so it is bad code practice to do this, but this will work based on what we're, by, based on this example that we're trying to do, but it's perhaps not, uh, it's perhaps not the best thing to do, and we'll, we'll, we'll show you a, some other, something else that you can do in just a second. But here, this would actually work. If I actually compiled this now, um, I'm not going to save it quite yet. What I want to do first is show you if before this change, I'm just going to run this code before the change, we can actually see that the swap did not occur for first num and second num, but now if I actually save this code, compile it, and run it, code 19, do we actually see that we have now successfully swapped first num and second num? All right, any questions on that? Okay, so now, we have this next um, 
we have this next, uh, this second iteration of this, which is ever so slightly different than, uh, than the first. But now, instead of dealing with these field variables, we are, in fact, going to deal with the, um, with these, uh, with these methods, or rather with this object here, swap a dot x and swap a dot y. So now, in this case, what we are doing is something just slightly different. Now what we are doing is we are dealing with the variables contained within this, this object a. But we are passing it into that same method that we saw before, just a second ago. So we're still calling this method where we pass in the two, the two integer variables and then we're trying to swap those. But remember, we changed this method. We actually changed this method above so that it actually manipulates first num and second num. And this is actually is going to be perhaps um, not, uh, not the specific side effect that was referenced just a minute ago, but it is a side effect where we're trying to swap these two numbers, but we're talking about we're referencing different numbers. This is actually not good. So I'm going to revert all of this back, and we're going to save this. We're going to try running this again. Oops, first I have to compile it. Then I'm going to run it. Oops, Java code 19. And we can see the results here. So again, when we're dealing with this object, we're dealing with copies of the variables contained within this object. We're not actually performing this swap. So to make this a little bit more concrete, if we take a look again at this code, we're actually using the same swap method. We're passing into it the x and the y values from our a object over here. And because we're passing it in by value, the same exact thing is happening, where x is 3, y is 4, the swap actually occurs, so x becomes 4, y becomes 3, and then all of that data is lost because there were local variables, and this doesn't actually happen as we would expect. But take a look at this. Now, if I actually use this other swap method, notice that I have here this other swap method, which is implemented in almost exactly the same way, except we're dealing with this point object, point A, and we're going to swap those values there. So now what I've done is I've just changed the code down here to use this other swap method by passing in this A object. I'm going to first compile and then I'm going to run it. Now we can actually see that the swap has been performed. So what's going on? Because why then if, I'm, if I've been saying this whole time that we're passing this, these values, uh, we're passing this data by value and not by reference, how then is it possible for this swap to actually occur? Right, exactly, and that is the, the second main point. There's two main points um, that are important to take away here. First of all, when we are passing data in methods in Java, we are always passing by value. The second point is that because it just so happens that whenever we're dealing with objects, those, the value of that variable is the reference to that object. It just so happens that the value that I'm passing when I'm actually calling this swap method is the reference to that object. So what this means then, in this other swap function, I'm going to erase this. This is the other swap function. I'm just going to call it other here to make it clear that which one we're dealing with. Now it accepts this, this value point, or it, it, it accepts this uh, variable called a in that, uh, here, let me scroll up a little bit so we can see it's accepting this variable called a that is of type point. And because then we are copying this value from our original a to here, it just so happens that that value is the same and it points to the same object in memory. Which means that when I manipulate the, co the, the contents of this object, it is manipulating that same object that we are referencing in our original context, in, in the original variable a from our main method. So now when we perform the swap, we can see that we have this other variable called temp, so we, can, we then are setting temp equal to a dot x, which is the field variable x, which in this case is 3. Then we are doing, then we're performing manipulations on the object directly. So here a dot x is equal to a dot y, but because a in this case references the same object, we are then changing the raw values within this object. So x becomes 4, and the last one y becomes, a dot y becomes this value temp, which is 3, and then the swap is actually performed as we expect. So this is 
something that's very important to keep in mind when you're dealing with Java and something that makes it sort of unique from a number of other languages, and that is this idea here, those, those two main points. First of all, uh, primitive objects, the values are always the, the, the primitive value um, for objects. The primitive, or rather for objects, the value is in fact the reference to that object, but we can never manipulate that reference directly. We never see that reference. We never know what it is. We can't manipulate it. We can't change it. Uh, unless we were going to change it to a reference of another object, some other concrete object that exists in memory. And whenever we pass, the second th important thing about Java is that whenever we pass data from one method to the other, when we call a method and we want to pass data to it, we always are passing the value of those variables. So for, in the case of primitive variables, we're passing the raw data and we get copies of that value. Uh, in the case of, of objects, we are passing a copy of that reference, which means that that same, uh, that, uh, that separate variable, which might be a local variable in the context of that method, points to the same object elsewhere in memory. That's an important distinction to make when talking about Java. Any questions here? Okay, so let's move on now. Now that you understand this distinction, this, can, this is going to be something that's important to us as you work with objects in, in your Android programming. Um, it's important to keep these, these different things in mind. Now, if we move on to code20.java, we'll actually see something that's also very important to us in the context of Android, and that is inheritance. Now, objects in, in Android are inheriting other objects all over the place. There's just all sorts of um, inheritance going on. There's just a lot of stuff that you have to keep track of and keep in mind as we start talking about um, Android in, in that context, because as you will see next week when we start dealing with actual programming of Android devices, we don't actually have, like I said before, this main method. We don't actually have this, uh, any, I mean, we don't have to deal with that at all. It's actually taken care of for us by some other method elsewhere. But what we do is inherit some other classes so that we retain or that we retrieve some of the methods and, and have access to some of the methods and variables that are associated with that class within our class that we are implementing. So what we are trying to show here in Code 20 is just a simple example of class inheritance. So here we have defined some classes for some other actual physical objects, in this case computers and various types of, of computers um, uh, that might exist in the world. So we have a very generic computer. Some of the things that we might want to map uh, in, in when we're creating a computer object are some relatively simple things. Maybe who makes the computer, what the model of that computer is, what the speed of that computer happens to be, when it was built, and one, one um, variable that we might have for state in this computer is whether or not that computer is actually on or off. And this is pretty much true for any type of computer that exists in the world today. It's going to have a make and a model, it's definitely going to have a year that it was built, it's going to uh, have a certain speed and it doesn't matter how we define this speed. Uh, we might do it in, in terms of gigahertz, which is you know, sort of iffy. We might do it in some other metric, but it doesn't matter what we define there as long as we're consistent. And here we also have uh, the, the variable of whether or not this computer is on. And some of the methods that are available in this, um, in this computer class are these. We can turn on the computer, we can turn it off, we can ask the question, is this computer on? and we can respond accordingly to all of this data. Now the field variables though, you'll notice, rather than having a lot of, um, a lot of private variables and a lot of get and set methods, we're just using a, sim a relatively simple Im implementation here of having these public variables so that it becomes very easy for us to pull and manipulate this data elsewhere. But there are, other, there are more specific types of computers than just a generic computer, right? What if we have a laptop? A laptop is still a computer, but there are some features that differentiate it from, say, a desktop. What if we had a server? There's definitely some features about a server that might differentiate it from a desktop computer or even a laptop. So for a laptop, what's one of the, the biggest differentiating factors from that and other types of computers? Yeah. Battery life. Battery life, yeah. So laptops have batteries. And so if we were to create a laptop class, then it's certainly the case that we perhaps want to be able to model this battery life. We, we want to remember what the battery life happens to be for that particular computer, but we still want to have access to some of these basic attributes that, that a laptop would have, even though they apply to a generic computer as well. So some of the options that we have would be to copy and paste this entire class, 
create a new class called laptop, copy paste all of this into it, and just append on this idea of a battery as well. And we could do that, but that's not a very good way of factoring out codes. So, I mean, one of the things that we like to do is to write as little, as few lines of code as possible and, and to try to reuse code as much as we possibly can. So what if there was a way that we could have this laptop class that then inherits some of the properties of this computer? What if this laptop class could have that battery life but could also inherit the, this, this idea of a make? could inherit this idea of a model, whether or not it is in fact turned on. And that is in exactly what we try to do in laptop.java. So notice the very first line of code here is different from all of the other classes that we've seen. We are still defining a class called laptop, but we are explicitly saying that it is an extension of this more generic class. Class laptop, in fact, extends computer. So we want it to inherit all of these, uh, these ideas of the um, that, that were available to us from the computer class, we don't want to replicate any of it, but we want to use that because that is in fact going to be useful to us within the context of this laptop. And so all then we have to do is implement all of the code for our battery. So we then create a new field variable, uh, private double battery, and it is going to be a battery, uh, it could be just a percentage for the battery level that that computer happens to be at right now. So we could set that battery level to something like, uh, here we go, if, if we pass in uh, some, some data to this method called set battery, we'll set the battery level equal to that that was passed into us. And we can also have something kind of cool where if it just so happens that the, the battery level is less than 1%, that computer is just going to automatically shut off just by, turning, by, turning, by running that turn off method from the inherited class. And if we wanted to fetch that battery life data, we could just have a very simple getter method here as well. But there's a couple of important things that we need to, to point out when we're talking about class inheritance. First of all, we still have a constructor class for the laptop, but we still need to, we still need to instantiate basically a copy of this parent class, of this computer class that was above. So what we need to do is run the superclasses, that's another way of saying, of saying the parent class, we need to run the superclasses constructor. We can do that very simply by using the super keyword and passing in all of the variables that are required from that constructor class of the computer class. And it, that uh, constructor class, I sort of went over it sort of quickly, but um, let's see, hopefully it's still here. You can actually see that we have here um, this computer class, this computer constructor class, and we're, it requires those four variables, the make, the model, the year, and the speed. And when we're dealing with this laptop class, we have to still pass that data to this super class, and we can do that very simply with this super keyword and passing in those same variables there. So uh, if we wanted to reference then the, um, that turnoff method that was available in the super class, we could do that using super.turnoff, but we don't have to. We could just say turnoff has been inherited by, by that class, and we can use that directly here as well. Now, what this means is that when we're actually dealing with each of, this, with each of these code, we can still treat a laptop as though it were a computer. We can still say that the laptop is either on or off. We can still say that the laptop has a make, a model, and a year, and it has um, and also a speed associated with it as well. But there's also another type of computer that we've impl implemented as well called a server. And a server is distinct from a laptop because, well, it may, it may have a, a battery, but that's probably in some separate unit um, uh, using a, uh, in, in, like an APC UPS or something like that. But really, that's not sort of the main idea of the server. What a server might have is perhaps some, some designation to say how high it actually is so that when it's actually racked in one of those enormous racks that are used for servers, we can actually then define how much height that's actually going to use. And so that's exactly what we're using here for server. So rather than implementing some code for a battery life, what might make for more sense for a server is the, the height of that computer so that we know where exactly we could place it within this, this larger rack of servers um, in our in our colo or whatever. But anyway, so here we do a very similar thing. We have a, a, new, a new class called server that in fact extends computer and we have to have a, a constructor class for that called the super classes constructor here and um, we have a variety of methods associated with that server as well. So if I then go back to code 20, can we actually see what exactly is happening? 
we have here a void main, which is of course the main method for this entire class, we can see a couple of things. We're going to create a couple of, of computers. Um, I don't know, uh, this must have been a, a, a strange, uh, this, this is definitely some leftover stuff from last year, but this should be new computer, I bet. So we have here a couple of different computers, a Mac Pro, a MacBook Air, and an XServe, and each of these is in fact given its appropriate data type. So we have here uh, uh, Mac Pro, which is a, just a generic computer, MacBook Air, which is just a laptop, and an XServe, which is in fact a server. And so we could turn on some of these, uh, some of these objects just by running their, their turn on uh, methods and then set the battery for the MacBook Air, set the rack height of the XServe. But notice that even though turn on was a method that was associated with that computer class, not with the laptop, not something that we, that we directly wrote in this laptop class directly, we can still access all of those methods in that super class. We really don't care how it was implemented. It was just inherited by this laptop class. And we can then still use that method in this laptop type uh, variable here as well. And so we have a whole bunch of things. If we just run this now so you can see what's, what's going on, Java code 20 runs a bunch of stuff. We can see that the Mac Pro has a specific speed, the Air has a specific speed and has now a battery level. Uh, the XServe has a specific speed and also has a, a rack height associated with it. We can find out which of these machines are, turn, are turned on. We could specify some, we could have a test to see if the MacBook Air is actually dying or, or what's happening with that. And we can turn some on, turn some off. And so I think what happens here is that we actually set the battery level below 1% in this case. So the MacBook Air died basically and it turned itself off. And then we can see then what happened uh, um, when we list all of the machines that are being run here. And so we can then um, uh, hopefully now it's becoming a little bit more clear what exactly is happening when we want to reference each of these, uh, each of these pieces of data from the field variables. We can just reference them directly because they are in fact public. So we can find out when this Mac Pro was built, what, it, what its make and model is, and we can output its speed and we can do some stuff here. We, like there's this method show running machines, which uh, we can actually see is implemented up here as finding out which of the machines are turned on just by asking very simply, if the Mac Pro is turned on, then we will, um, then we will say that it's turned on. If the, if the air is on, then we will say that is on and so on and so forth. Uh, and, um, and if we come back down here, we can see exactly like I said before, uh, we've output, oh, the, the fact that the MacBook's Air, MacBook Air's battery is dying, we can set the battery level to below 1%, which in this case is just 0%, which automatically shuts off that machine, you know, just based on our implementation of this code. And when we show the, the machines that are running again, we can find out that that one has, in fact, turned off altogether. Now, um, this, let's see, oh, so here, I suppose the important bit was that um, the, we have defined this Mac Pro as a computer. But when, when we actually instantiated a copy of that down below, when it actually said new laptop here, this actually shows something that's relatively interesting with regard to um, class inheritance is that we can actually essentially devolve these subclasses back to their parent classes in this manner. So we have here the very, at the very beginning of this, of this class, when we've actually defined these field variables, we had the Mac Pro, the MacBook Air, and the, and the XServe, we've actually defined them appropriately. The Mac Pro is the computer, the MacBook Air is the laptop, the XServe is the server. But recall that a laptop is basically just a computer with some extra stuff associated with it. So it is very much the case that we could do something like this. And sometimes you will see something like this um, in, in some Android code where we actually want to instantiate a new laptop but that because that includes all of that server stuff, or all of that, rather, all of that computer stuff, that it does, in fact, um, devolve back to just that computer back that, uh, that we had uh, set the type to above. And so with this, with class inheritance, with this idea of the way that we, that we set um, uh, the values of, of specific um, of specific variables, if they're primitive to these, um, to their primitive data type, if they're objects to their reference, that we pass each of those uh, variables as by value when we're dealing with methods. All of this stuff is going to come together and hopefully make, when we start talking about Android very specifically next week, 
will hopefully make it a little bit easier to get your feet wet. And so for today, that concludes what we are talking about with regard to the Java Primer. Next week, we're going to start diving into Eclipse. And later on today, will the, the first project or the first Android project be released? And I heavily encourage you to start um, downloading Eclipse and get everything ready because that is, uh, it is a relatively easy project compared to the staff project, but it is something that will take just a little bit of time for you to step through each of those things. And so until next week, thank you all very much for coming. and We will see you then.